Hey folks, my name is Paul Hudson. Uh, I got in yesterday from Tokyo, Japan, so um, if I fall asleep while speaking, just let me sleep, okay? <laughs> just sneak out the back, I'll be here a while, I need it. Uh, you might know me from the 100AS50 UI, which has been updated, by the way, for iOS 17 shortly, and still free, which is great. Uh, I write stacks of books about Swift and Swift UI and other things like that. And if you go to this URL in the next sort of day or so, you can get a free book. Swift Design Patterns. Get a picture. You've got 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven. I lied. Five, four, three, two, but no! Shame. I also make Hacking with Swift Plus. And go to that URL and get a free month, or five, five dollar month, sorry, for a month. Give it a try. Anyway, my talk is called Level Up your Swift UI. But what does level up mean? Now, what it doesn't mean, and I can be really emphatic about this, does not mean throwing away your projects and starting again. Please don't do that. I have people saying, should I rewrite my UI kit code in Swift UI? Yeah, you can totally do that. If you want the same product with a thousand all new bugs, great. <laughs> However, please don't do that. Instead, this talk is about helping you make very small, incremental steps to improve what you already have. Going from older Swift UI up to fancy new Swift UI. That's the goal. Now, random tangent. Did anyone else notice Apple change the Swift UI logo? Like in June this year. And I know, the, the screen's a bit bright, but you can get an idea, right? They've, they've modified it slightly. And I think it's intentional. Because in June this year, they also announced Swift Data with the same logo attached to it, which, of course, also matches Swift itself. And this is very much unlike Swift Charts from last year. That was Swift Space Charts. No bird logo. These all have bird logos. And I think genuinely, this is in, in, intentional. This is part of their plan. Because this, folks, is the new Coco. Now, if you don't know what Coco is, and there's old uh, Apple stuff, Coco was foundation, it was app kit, and it was core data in one thing. Which, of course, matches what we have today. We have a Swift standard library. We have Swift UI. And now we have Swift data, the bird logos. I suspect next year, any use of frameworks will have Swift, Space, blah, 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 and no bird logo, but we'll see. Anyway, this talk is Swift UI. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I love all the new things, the Swift UI, famous for loving what's new in Swift UI. A large amount of this talk is gonna require iOS 17. <laughs> <laughs> but some things will work great on 16 as well. A handful of things work great in 15. Some, believe it or not, still work on 14. And some will even work on 13. <laughs> so there's something for everyone. Like I said, I literally just got back from a, a long vacation in Japan. We saw stacks of old things like this lovely golden temple, Kinkakuji in Kyoto. Tons of new things. My, my spiritual home, Nintendo World in Osaka. <laughs> it was so good. Uh, we saw some cultural things like a sumo event, really cool. And of course, we ate an absurd amount of Japanese food. It's really, really good. And a whole month of gym time, I feel, to get the Japanese weight off again. But it was really good. Now, a normal person would see these things and go, wow, Japan's great. I love Japan. So much fun. But we're not normal. That's why we're here, right? And so I thought, I'm going to build an app about my experiences in Japan. And the app isn't too hard. It's designed to track the things I liked the most about my trip. You can see here, there's a whole bunch of foods. You can just swipe your way through and see the things I liked. And when you want to, you can scroll down and see all the drinks I liked as well. And below that, activities like uh, maid cafes and gachapon and onsen and more, right? Not complicated app. Plus, some searching, like that. And when you want to, 
and press this button here to like it. I've done that thing, I've drank one of these or eaten that thing. And for Shinkansen, great fun by the way, best trains in the world, many of those. We had so many Shinkansen trips, so much fun. Hammer it a lot. And that's the entire app. It's simple by design, but it's a neat little sandbox for us to experiment with, to look for ways we can level up our Swift UI. Now behind the scenes here, of course, what we're seeing is a large horizontal scroll view with moving views through, as repeated vertically for various categories, food, drinks, activities. And as you just swipe through these, we just go through, one to the next, to the next, all the way through to the end. But at any point, they can say, you know, let's just go part way. So you can't really see the one before or the one after. It's a free scrolling scroll view. And that, let's face it, is weird. Why would you want to do that? You can see it here in the application. Uh, this is our uh, app here again. You can swipe through. Very nice, very nice, very nice. But it's free scrolling. So I can say, let's just go there. Or I can do that and vertically do a little half scroll as well, so you can basically see nothing useful at all. And that's how the app works right now. Helpfully, this is resolved fully in iOS 17. There's a new modifier called scroll target behavior. We can say paging, which means swipe one whole screen of scroll data at a time. Or view aligned, snap to these exact views in my scroll view. Now, which exact views you want, you can choose, or you can say, make the whole layout a scroll target. So every child view can be snapped to. So we'll add a view aligned and a scroll target layout to our code. And our code right now, this part of the code, our listing view looks like this. We have a uh, list, unsurprisingly. We have a loop over our, all our categories. Then inside each category, we have one scroll view to go horizontally. Inside there, we have this H stack, all our horizontal values. And then we loop over all the items inside there and make an item view from there. So a scroll view of scroll views. Additionally, we also add some padding to the horizontal scroll view so they don't go edge to edge. Now, that's our current code. We're going to modify this with a new scroll target behavior modifier using view aligned. Snap to the child views inside this scroll view. One line of code. Now, which views are snapped to? Well, the answer is all of them. A second line of code. Below our padding, we'll say this is a scroll target layout. Every child view, every one of these item views on line 23 is now something to be snapped to inside the scroll view. Two lines of code. The difference is dramatic. If you look back now, we should find, there's our layout, we just swipe and release and we get a line scrolling every time, all the way through to the very end. And if you try and go part way, like here, if I press and hold and release, it snaps the nearest child view you can get. A big improvement in just two lines of code. But it's not perfect. <laughs> this should offend your eyes, right? This is wrong. And that's caused because we've asked for horizontal padding of 20 points. We've pushed everything in horizontally by 20 points. It's off by 20 again and again and again. Now, if you imagine our views zoomed out across the whole screen like that, that's what we're seeing behind the scenes. If we apply padding horizontally of 20 points to that, it'll be sucked in from the leading and trailing edges like that. If we had 40 points, it goes even further but it's applying it to the start and end of the whole content. New, iOS 17, we can say apply content margins, and it will indent the safe area, bringing the whole thing in from the edge of the screen, like that for 20 points, or like this for 40 points. A big difference. And so now we can go back to our code again. There's our current padding horizontal 20, we can rip that out and apply that extra modifier saying apply content margins of 20 points to the scroll's content. And then critically afterwards, move this lift, list row offset down to the end here. Inset, sorry. 
apply no further insets after I've changed my content margin. A tiny change, but now we see this result. It aligns to the leading edge of nine foods every single time, rather than going at random positions. And it's better. Again, one line of code change. That's three lines total so far. But <laughs> it's still not perfect. And if the Japanese are known for anything, it's making perfect things, right? They love detail. We can do better with another iOS 17 modifier. Container relative frame. You give this thing an axis, like vertical or horizontal, and then it will size the child view according to its parent size. So we might say, be parent size times 0.5, be half the parent's width. Or size times 0.333, be a third of the parent's width. There's another option here. We could say, uh, take our parent's horizontal size, divide it into five columns, and then make each view span two of those five columns or four of those five columns, depending on what you want to get. But best of all, the simplest option is just to say, container relative frame, horizontal. Just that. And that means, please match the full width of my container, subtracting any safe area insets, which is perfect because we've just used content margins. Brought the whole thing in from the leading and trading edge by 20 points. And so, Back in our code again, here's our current uh, list row insets there, like before. We're going to look at where we defined our item view. We can jump that definition here to hold to our U by itself. Here's one view, one content thing in our la uh, layout here. And you see it has an exact frame width of 320. We don't want that anymore. We'll take that out, because in iOS 17 onwards, we can say, apply after everything else a container relative frame of horizontal. Match the full width of my parent scroll view minus those safe area insets. It's a tiny change. It's now four lines of code, but we get the perfect App Store style scrolling experience. Equal amount of content on the leading and trailing edge every time. And this is really the optimal way of doing scrolling. Users can see visually on the screen there's more stuff ahead, more stuff behind. It takes almost no code. So we get really nice, smart scrolling. And again, we have to say, I want a view aligned scroll target behavior. Make all the child views be things we snap to. Apply 20 points of safe area extra insets for the scroll content, and make each child view have the same size as its parent container. There's four lines of changes. It's brilliant, with one fatal flaw. Sadly, only works in iOS 17. So you're probably thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> I can't use this. I've got to support iOS 16, 15, some of you perhaps even 14. So let's look at something for you folks. <laughs> <laughs> something that works in slightly older versions of iOS, because there are lovely improvements here too. For example, here's our code again. Uh, how often have we written line 51, give me a rounded rectangle with corner radius of 25? Right? It's a common thing to want to write into a UI code. Well, new in Xcode 15, we can now just say clip shape of dot rect with a corner radius of, was it 25, 20, 25. Saving you literally seconds every day. <laughs> <laughs> and that works back to iOS 13. Woo, <laughs> yeah. Because if you look at the SwiftUI interface file that ships with Xcode, you'll see this. They mark and always available for iOS 13 with a new rect method with a corner radius and style, which calls down to that same initializer we had before. But critically, they mark it always emit into client. It copies that initializer directly into your code at build time, which is why it works back to iOS 13. Now, I should say, if you look very closely while this thing was running back, you'll see there's another option here for our rect. We use rect corner radius 25. There's also this. If I delete that and try dot rect again, you'll see dot rect with corner radii. Lovely plural view there. And uh, 
This is brilliant because you now get an uneven rounded rect coming back to you. Round some corners, not others. And that back ports to iOS 16, which is great. We don't want that here, of course, let's undo that change. We'll keep with our current uh, rect code. Nice little simplification. But there are more of these, thanks to Xcode 15. For example, we can look at the way our project uses buttons. If we use a search thing up on the left here and search a button, we should see there are two buttons in my code right now. Let's have a look. Yeah, there's two. Great. Uh, this first one is to handle liking a thing or doing a thing. I've, I've eaten a, a milk roll or had some calpis water or whatever. Like one thing. The other one is in our toolbar code to handle uh, just erasing the data. And this uses fairly common Swift UI code at this point. And you will know back in iOS 13, we could say maybe a button with a text hello calling some function. That's classic Swift UI code. iOS 14, it changed slightly with a trailing closure. You could now say, I want to have a label. So text plus system, system image calling action. But new in Xcode 15, beta 5, I think this was snuck in really, really late in the process, after dub dub by a long way, is a new initializer. Backport to iOS 14. No more label required. Give a text and image in one, less code, less typing, more time playing Minecraft, what you want to do this better time. <laughs> but backports beautifully for the same reason. Always meant the client copies the code across into your finished build. So we can go back to our code again. And here's my current button with a label inside it. That label is the exact thing I want to have in my button initializer. So I can basically just grab the array's data, just the image part, that text there. Command X that to my clipboard and just paste it on in. Add a comma and then just zap the trade enclosure. Simpler, cleaner, nicer code, very easy to do. Or for the other button, this one here, uh, again you can see it has the uh, label, uh, multiple trade enclosure there. We can just grab the text part out, a data model four, plus a system image, grab that out again to the clipboard and put that into the button initializer directly and delete the trade enclosure like so. Beautiful. Really nice. Of course, the app looks the same, right? Neither of those changes, you know, less typing's great, less RSI, hooray, but they don't change the way our app looks. The result's the same. There's neater ways of writing Swift UI code. So let's look at some changes that affect what our user sees. For example, let's do a search. Go to the search box and I type in here, let's look for M-I-S-T. And we get this. We get one foods. <laughs> Not great. And given where we are in the world, you'll be painfully familiar with how bad English is at plurals. You'll know we say we have one drink and two drinks. You think, oh, this is very easy. And you say, well, there's one person, <laughs> but there's two people. There is uh, one mouse, but two mice. And my favorite person is sheep. We have one sheep and we have two sheep. <laughs> and quite brilliantly, when we have none of those things, we also use plurals, because <laughs> obviously. This is clearly infuriating, right? No one wants to deal with this. So you either see the ternary conditional operator scattered around, or you see lazy code like this. Drink brackets S, right? <laughs> it, it works. You can see you've got one drinks, or two drinks, or five drinks, whatever. It works, not ideal. We can do better. We can now use specific markdown inflection support baked into iOS these days. We can say, I want to have some number of drink inflect true for both those values, specifying it as drink singular, and we'll now get back automatically one drink and five drinks. It takes care of it, which is really, really nice. Through this, you'll see we have in our code again, as our current uh, item view, the section headers are handed in our listing view over here. There's a JSON for it. You can see foods right there. That thing's currently plural. Again, we'll make it singular. We'll say, let's use food for our title, like that. And then we have three of these sections. The first one's food. The second will be uh, drinks down below. Let's find out. Please, new drinks. 
please. There we go. Nope. Drinks. Nope. Not getting it. Not getting drinks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> drinks. Boom. Again, make it drink, singular. And then activities. Drop the I, yes. Put in a Y activity. Like that. So our data becomes singular. And now over in our listing view, we can say, let's find out where that code's being ha handled. Here is our header on line 31. Inside there, you can see there's a text view of data model title for our category. Fetch the correct title based on our current lazy pluralization rules. And we just jump into that. We can say jump to that definition inside there. Boom. And there's our current code. Items count category ID. So one foods, three drinks, whatever. Now, critically, this thing is currently returning a localized string key, which is generally best practice, right? Make this thing localizable. And because it's doing that, we can add our magic mark down here and say, make this whole thing here inflected like that, inflect true. Not even a one line here, it's like a half line change of code, right? Really, really small change. And that's all it takes. We can build and run our code, run it again, go to the search, and I'll just do uh, shin, and we get one food, we get zero drinks, and one activity automatically. This is powered by iOS's automatic grammar agreement. And this shipped in iOS 15 with support for English and Spanish. In 16, they added support for French, Italian, and Brazilian Portuguese. And 17, they added support for European Portuguese and, hooray, German. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So at this point, you get what we call EP figs, European, Portuguese, French, Italian, German, Spanish, out of the box. It works fantastically well. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, your app's about Japan. How does it handle Japanese? It's not on the list, right? Well, great. Fortunately, that language works out of the box. <laughs> it's no, no <laughs> stupid rules. It just works, right? <laughs> Sensible language. <laughs> Let's look at some more changes that affect what the user sees, including view layout. Back in our project here, you can see we've got our, our scroll view of stuff. And as I scroll this, through this thing, you can see they're all about the same size in height, apart from this milk roll one here. Different size. It's very nice, by the way. <laughs> if I sort of scroll back and hold a little bit, you'll see what I mean. See the little jump in the little white line? That's because one of these things has one line of text, one has two lines of text. It doesn't look right. We can do better. So, you'll know already this thing is powered by a simple text view. Show the description in some text. And as of iOS 13, we can say, make sure this thing is up to two lines. From 16 onwards, we can say, be between two and five lines, inclusive either side. We can also say, line limit two reserves space true. Be prepared to expand up to two lines if necessary, leaving space for that rather than jumping around. And so, another one line change to our code. Uh, here's our current item view of the button. If we go and find the uh, text here, there is our description right now, we'll say you have a line limit of two, reserving space for true. Simple, small, another one line change, I love it. And the result is hopefully now equally sized views across the board. Everything is correct. It's moved up the way, leaving space of two lines. Next, one of my all-time favorite SwiftUI features. In fact, last year when this shipped, I did a live stream uh, at the Apple Developer Center, and I, I went, it's so good. Ooh, I was sort of stroking where the screen was in my, in my thing. I just love this so much. It's so simple. Easy color gradients. Apple done a ton of work at color gradients working really, really well for us. Um, in our code again, uh, we have a, a blue color behind these views. It's down here, background.blue. And if we said, I want background.blue dot gradient, a tiny change, like an eight letter, whatever it is, 10 letter change, small. Let's see how good your screen is, shall we? <laughs> now you get a subtle, beautiful difference. All these things have a very, very gentle blue gradient behind it. And this works for all the built-in system colors and all custom colors. Can you see that? Mm. It looks great. Go and run it on your, on your Mac. <laughs> so, tiny change. I love it. Speaking of color, 
Another change we can make. You'll know that SF symbols added support for colored symbols a while ago. We can say, make these things multi colored so we get a nice sort of sun and rain, or a battery charging, or a rainbow. That's all powered by a simple modifier, symbol rendering mode multicolor. Like that, get a lovely multicolor design out of the box free of charge. But new in iOS 17, we can now say apply a symbol effect to modify this thing rendering at runtime dynamically. Question is, what goes there? And it depends. What are you trying to achieve? For example, you might say, I want to have a variable color rainbow. And you'll get a lovely pulsing effect, like that. One line of code. You could say, I want a variable color with reversing. And that was up and down again. Constant like that. You can say, I want iterative. And this will look the same because your screen isn't particularly excellent, but we'll see. Uh, this one will sort of build up like that and go away again, like a pulse wave effect. Or that reversing. And if you want to, you can hide the inactive layers. And this, this will look the same because it's black otherwise. Should the layers be hidden or dimmed, it's down to you, you can choose. And you can stack them up as much as you want to. Variable, iterative, hiding, reversing the lot, just build it up, build it up, build it up. And so in our app here, we have a little loading screen, which shows a little uh, SF symbol to show the app is fetching virtual data from a network request. Uh, it is over in our uh, loading view, over here. There we go. Antenna, radio waves, left and right. That's it. I will make this thing have a gentle pulsing animation to show the user this thing's fetching network data right now. So we'll say another modifier here next to the font, a symbol effect saying make sure we have a variable color, also iterative. Let's see if you can just about see us on the screen. Let's find out. Now we play that one back, uh, holding the screen longer. You can just that maybe see. There you go. So the waves are sort of pulsing outwards. Almost no code. I love it. More changes we can make. You've seen it earlier, some things I like once or twice, some things like Shinkansen, the best trains in the world, I love them so much, I like a lot. And what happens is, we, we can press this like button uh, for our thing, it's currently on zero for Mr. Donut here, and we like it, it just goes up to higher numbers, so I could say, find a thing I really, really like, like uh, my favorite drink of all time, Calpus water, I can like it, and like it again, and like it again, and like it again, and like it again, and just tap, 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 it's rather tedious. Again, we can do better. Now, old classic button code in Swift DUI, a title and action. From 17 onwards, we can now say, add a button repeat behavior of enabled. It'll take care of pressing it once to trigger it once, but as they hold it down, it triggers faster and faster and faster automatically. Again, just one line of code change. So here's our uh, loading view right now. We can skip across to where we have that like button in our item view. It is just above here, I believe. There we go. There's button style for our button right now. That's our liking button. We're going to modify that to say, make sure we have that button repeat behavior built in of enabled. One line change. And now we run the code again. We should see I can now press and hold on things to like it many times. Let's find something great. There we are. Milk row is really, really good, trust me. And my stomach. And we press and hold on this thing. It'll start slow and pick up speed automatically on a platform-dependent behavior. I am like half milk roll at this point, trust me. I've had a lot of milk roll. <laughs> Next up, what happens when we have no results to show? Like this, I've searched for this books in my search. There's no foods, no drinks, no activities, match that. It's not great. What should happen when we have no search results? And the answer is no one seems to know. Like Apple don't know, that's for sure. If you ask them for an unknown search, in mail it says, no results found in really dim gray text. <laughs> in the app store you see, no results in big white text, and below that in dim text, four of books. In photos, no results, and below that, there were no results for your search, try a new search. In weather, you get an icon this time, no results. In files, again, something different. Uh, in iTunes, you get a huge icon. <laughs> Every one of Apple's apps are different. They can't decide either. And so helpful is now a solved problem for them and for us. We can now, as of iOS 17, say content unavailable view with some text and an icon, and it'll present a standard system UI, no results. 
Now, I personally think this API was made for Apple to try and get better size to the same thing everywhere. But it's open for us two to use, so please do. And you can customize it. You could say, I want to have some description text in here. You know, please search again. And you get that dim gray text below. You can probably just make it up below. Please search again, but appears below. And if you want full control, you know, semi-standard UI, you can say, OK, I want a completely custom unavailable view with custom description, custom actions. I want to have that exact image and this exact font and this text that I do. I want to have some text below saying, get started today. I want to have a button below that saying whatever. A fairly standard first run of screen, and you get this great standard UI. It looks really, really nice. And best of all, for the most common use, searching, you can just say unavailable view dot search. And it'll check the view hierarchy to find the nearest search bar, your text from that, and display it automatically in your UI. Now, in this app, we have three sections, food, drinks, and activities. So I'm not going to use that here. I'll use a slightly more custom version here. So in our code, this is our item view. We can go across to our listing view, where you list these different things. And all being well, it might go across the listing view. Mm, there we go. There we go. There's our items right now. We can say, if that is empty, if there are no items matching our search, then use a new content unavailable view. Our assets thing use a custom title and an icon attached to it, like that. Now, the string I'll specify here will be a custom string. None of our category things match the search of whatever search you're looking for in our data model right now, like so. And then for the icon, we have one baked in already. I'm going to use category.icon, like that. Boom. And then everything else, the current scroll view we had before, that becomes our else block. So it couldn't find items, show that. Otherwise, show everything we had before, just wrap everything else in that else block. Boom, like so. So not a one-line change. We include the else and yada yada, but very simple change still. But the result looks very nice. Much more standard, standard than Apple's UI. So here we have our default layout. We'll do a little search again. So it was Vizz's Books or McDonald's. Terrible Japanese food, obviously. <laughs> and you see it matches nothing with custom icons down the line. Very, very nice. So let's wrap up. We've looked at the two lines of code required to get better scroll snapping. Telling the scroll view to snap to individual views or paging if that's what you want. And make every view inside there or those child views be a scroll target layout. We then brought in the scroll content by 20 points. That's adjusting the safe area inset, not simple padding. We then made those child views, the item views, have a container relative frame of horizontal, match the full size of my parent minus that safe area inset we added. We looked at new back deployed helper code, simpler.ret corner radius, or the new button initialize from Xcode beta 5 or so to do text and icon and action in one initializer rather than trading closures. We saw automatic grammar agreement to inflect strings and EP figs out of the box. We saw how to reserve text size, be at least, or at least two lines, always, and leave space for it, even if you are one line, leave space below. We saw my favorite thing, a beautiful, simple color gradients. Well, I saw them. You said the back, you won't see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw them. They're very nice, trust me. And we saw the SF symbol animations. Now, I should tell you, folks, at the Apple Park this year, WWDC, I met the uh, SF symbols team. Because I, I tweeted something like, you can now animate SF symbols. And I tweeted it during the State of the Union. And they're like, how did you do that? We haven't released it yet. How have you released it? <laughs> so I went to the URL and said, download SF symbols 4, change the 4 to be 5. Downloaded it. <laughs> it worked straight away. <laughs> it's great. Apple security all the way. But I gave them all a big hug because SF Symbols is a, a great team. I love their work so much. Anyway, very nice. <laughs> With repeating buttons. Again, a one line change. Enable, press and hold on this thing. And we saw how to handle missing content gracefully and beautifully in a standard way. Now, although almost all of these were simple one line changes, it's still a lot of code to think about. But honestly, only some of these things you'll actually want in your project. And that's okay, right? The, my goal here is to try and show you what's possible, and you can go back in two days' time and experiment which things you think will work well in your project. It doesn't have to be 
all or nothing. Again, we're not just throwing away what you have. These are incremental changes. Even one small change from here can improve your project. It's an improvement. As we saw, quite a few things work in 17, but they go backwards gracefully for a few things, some back to 13 as well. But to get this new functionality, you do have to have Xcode 15. Some of those changes are in the SwiftUI interface file that bundled with Xcode 15. You'll have that to get the new backported stuff. With that, I'm done. Thank you very much. So, do we have questions? I stayed awake. <laughs> I stayed awake. I'm, I'm quite pleased with myself. <laughs> Hello. Hey, how are you doing, stuff? I'm doing fine. I didn't understand how you do the loading view. Is it n uh, probably missed something the last four years? The loading view? You yeah. showed something where yeah. you... Oh, yeah. Is it like replacing the old like loading storyboard no, or whatever? It, it, it's because it's a sandbox app for fun. <laughs> it's just for testing purposes. I'll okay. Demonstrate it in a nice, so there's still no way, way in... Um, what would be the recommended that, way? Well, that was... That was an, it's not actually in the code. It's a simple uh, task, sleep, three seconds, show the UI. It's simulating a, a network request to fetch my actual favorites from Japan. Um, and so that's the way I do it in modern code. OK, because I haven't uh, touched any of, of the code for the last few months. But as far as I remember, there was this problem with SwiftUI apps that they didn't have like the loading storyboard thingy. Oh, like a splash screen. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, what I mean. It's kind of gone away now, isn't it, really? Um, I think because. Remember the old days, you'd have like a, a screenshot of your app when it was loading because it couldn't load fast enough? Yeah. yeah. Show my age a little bit, and your age too. Um, I think they just load so quickly these days. It's absurd. At the point now, we get, you used to get like this Twitter bird animation sort of flying up and stuff because they can. They've got spare CPU cycles to burn. Um, unless your app is doing extensive things on loading, it just loads instantly. Uh, and so I think it's, you don't worry about it too much anymore, is the answer. Okay, thanks. Mm. Uh, hey, Paul. Hey. Uh, I have to tell you, I was quite amazed by, them, by your talk. I've just Thank been you. sitting with my jaw dropped to the floor this whole time. Great. Yeah. That's a good result. And uh, <laughs> this is probably a greedy question, but tell me you have more. I want more. You want more? <laughs> well, I mean, I had, to, I had to cut the talk down to size. Well, the thing is, if I had more time, I'd have totally gone to observable. Observable is beautiful, and if you can ship for iOS 17, you should, because it is much less code and less uh, likely to open up for bugs, and also runs faster. So if I had another five minutes, I'd say, right, let's go and do Observable now, because it's, it's really, really nice. Um, and there are stacks of things. I, mean, the, the, I don't know what happened. The scroll view team seem to have gone to town in iOS 17. I love it. They're like, let's do this and this and this. And there's so many cool effects you can apply now out of the box. And in fact, tomorrow, it's a brilliant talk and an amazing new iOS 17 feature. You can add metal shaders to your Swift UI stuff. It is so cool. I am totally psyched for the talk <laughs> because metal is great fun and actually fairly, no offense, no, fairly easy <laughs> to get started with. I'm sure it goes further and further, it's harder and harder and harder. But to noodle around, you can get started very quickly. And it's lightning fast. Swift UI is baked in these days. So I'd do that as well, crikey. I mean, I'd probably struggle to squeeze into an app about you know, drinks and stuff, but it's very cool anyway. Um, yeah, so I said they've gone to town. What they haven't done, and genuinely this annoys me, we're now, what, 2019 launch, 2020, 2021, 2022. We're quite a few years with UI now, right? There's still no WK web view in Swift UI. And at the WC Apple Park, they have a thing, meet the teams. You can go and meet the teams. And it was supposed to be, like last year when it happened, it was supposed to be like, you know, come and meet the folks who make Swift UI, shake their hands, get a selfie. Ends up being like impromptu labs, like, my code's broken, it looks so good. Um, so they were kind of like deer in the headlights the first year, but this year they were ready for it. And this year, go and hammer them Swift UI questions and hammer them with data questions like usual. And uh, I had five minutes spare. I'm like, okay, where is the Safari team? And I, there they are. I ran across the room in Apple Park to get to the Safari team, and it was like one minute to closing of the labs, or the after, after teams. And I was like, why is there no <laughs> web view in Swift UI? And they're like, ah, oh, ha, ha, look. Oh, well, sadly, it's time to go. <laughs> I'm like, no, I have 
I've paid $5,000 to be here. I've flown in from the UK, a hotel and food. Uh, and they're like, oh, file a radar. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and so that's an expensive radar, right? So I am now this close to starting a social media campaign to get folks to bombard them with feedback asking for WebView because it's embarrassing. So they added lots of things, but no WebView. So keep eyes posted for that one. We'll see. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, second question. Uh, you got me excited about uh, the autogram automatic grammar. Yeah, great. It's like, cool, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, I was hoping to see more tricky languages with plurals like uh, Russian or Arabic. I see it's not supported. What should you do in this case? Yeah. Uh, hi, people is the answer. I'm afraid. <laughs> you're, you're right. Uh, Polish. I love particularly because brilliant rules in Polish. Um, yeah, it's difficult. Uh, and if you are fortunate enough to support EPFigs, Chinese, Japanese, other simple plural languages, great. If you aren't, you are stuck hiring people. Um, the thing is, that string goes through the whole NS localized string key process anyway. It's not fancy by any means. So you kind of localize the bits you need to for Arabic or whatever you need to um, while leaving the automatic stuff working. If you watch their demos, they do two things. One's good, one's bad. The good thing is they show you the more advanced things you can do. Uh, so in English, you'd say, you know, the large salad or the small salad, whatever. They show you that in Spanish, where the small also changes masculine and feminine depending on what it's modifying. Like salad's one thing, steak's another thing, whatever. So it modifies it very cleverly across many languages, the main words, which is very cool. The bad thing is, I don't know why they do this, they don't actually say publicly anywhere what the languages they support are. Now, I know it's that list there, because I asked someone, hey, what is it? Go, okay, here you are, here's some the code. Blah, 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 blah. They don't do that. I don't know why. <laughs> so um, ask them, A, write some documentation, please. That's your job, Apple. And B, how about Arabic and Russian and other hard languages? Thank you so much. <laughs> More questions. <laughs> yeah, one, one quick question. Will you be around for or will you go back to uh, Spain? <laughs> 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 uh, I wish. I've been there five weeks. It was so nice. Uh, no, I'm here today. The rest of the day, I've had a ton of coffee, so I am buzzing now. <laughs> I'm here tonight at the party. I'll be here tomorrow listening to the metal talk and the rest of the great talks. But most of metal talk. <laughs> uh, and yeah, if you want to bother me or ask questions or you want to, I'm, I'm around, so you know, bring it on. We will. Thank you. Do it. Alrighty. <laughs>